Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Bill Woodcock. Bill is the executive director of Packet Clearinghouse, the international non-governmental organization that builds and supports critical internet infrastructure, including internet exchange points and the core of the domain name system. Since entering the internet industry in 1985, Bill has helped establish more than 300 internet exchange points. In 2011, Bill wrote the first survey of internet interconnection agreements as input to the OECD's analysis of the internet economy. He then conducted follow-on surveys in 2016 and 2021 with the participation of more than 27,000 internet service providers in 192 countries. Bill also served on the board of the American Registry for Internet Numbers for 15 years. And currently, Bill's work focuses on the security and economic stability of critical internet infrastructure. So Bill, you know about our three plus one format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment. I'm gonna put the first question on screen. So um, how do you interpret the relationship between users accessing more content and services online and the impact this may have on telcos? I think an important basis for understanding the economics of the internet today and how providers uh, do business is to look at the, the economic development of the internet, which has essentially been in three eras. The first era in 1968 to 1992 was what I usually refer to as the communist era of the internet. The U.S. Defense Department um, paid for all services and determined how they would be distributed. Uh, it was not legal to buy or sell. You got as much as the DOD decided you needed, and that was it. Uh, then as the internet was growing, that started to become untenable and Al Gore uh, came along and devised the National Information Infrastructure Plan, mm -hmm. which in 1992 privatized the economics of the internet, allowing the private sector to produce bandwidth and buy it and sell it. Uh, and that persisted until 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, so that middle era, the sort of capitalist era of the internet is the one that sort of best fits with our ideas about how companies and economies and business sectors are supposed to work. But then in uh, 2001, we had the unfortunate confluence of 9-11 and the collapse of the telecom investment bubble. And the US government again was responsible for a shift in the economic model of the internet from capitalist to surveillance. So instead of a two-party model in which a provider creates a service and sells it to a customer and the provider is responsible to their customer and the customer has market choice and can uh, choose from other providers if they wish, um, we go to a situation where the provider of the service is collecting data about the customer mm -hmm. and may not even bother to charge the customer anything because they make the money by selling the data about the customer. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, I think there's this notion that GDPR has solved this problem for Europeans somehow, but clearly this is not the case because services are still available at below market rates to Europeans and European data is still feeding this surveillance economy. So um, the problem here is that telcos in Europe are still uh, hugely dependent upon the data that they are collecting about customers and selling. And this means that they are not actually profitable based upon what they're charging customers. So in a normal economy with normal services, if your customer wants more of what you're providing and you're profitable, you can sell them more and become more profitable. In the telco model, unfortunately, the customer wants more bandwidth to view more content, talk with more people, you know, do more home automation, whatever. Um, 
and the provider, the phone company looks at this and says, well, I've already got your data and I'm already selling your data. And now you want more bandwidth from me, but I'm not going to make more money by selling your data just because you used more bandwidth. This is creating greater costs for me, but not increasing my revenues. So if we had a rational market in which providers were responsible to customers more than to investors, or at least to, to both, um, the providers would be happy to sell more of what they have to sell. But as it is, they're relying upon the customers to produce data, which they sell, rather than relying upon the customers to pay for bandwidth, which they sell. And this is not the model that they are purporting to be in. So there is this dissonance, this friction between the economic model that they're actually operating under versus the one that they tell customers and regulators that they're operating under. And that dissonance comes out in the form of, gosh, we can't afford to sell more of what we sell to customers, even though we're profitable, because somehow we would be less profitable if we sold more. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, that that exposes the, the fiction of what they're doing. But I think there are too few people who look at the economic underpinnings of the internet and, and see what these two models are and, and why they're uh, in conflict. Yeah, I, th I honestly think that most people do not associate government surveillance to telcos uh, or to surveillance, not government, surveillance to telcos and, and usually associate more to the service providers on the internet, let's say, not the infrastructure layer. So it is interesting to know that even with my telecom provider, I am again the product. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not buying a product from them. They are using me as a product, which can... Well, we we constantly see new revelations about this. Just last week, we saw a revelation that Vodafone was inserting a new kind of difficult to detect tracker into their customers' uh, online transactions in order to monetize those transactions further. So Vodafone, in theory, should be making their money by charging their customer for internet access. Yet, in fact, what they're doing is they're monetizing their customer by turning the customer into the product, handing the customer a tracker, and then seeing where the customer goes online, and then selling third parties information about the customer's behavior online. And their R&D is not going into how to provide more bandwidth more effectively to their customer. Their R&D is going into how to track their customer's activity uh, against the wishes of the customer more covertly. That's not really what we want telcos to be spending their R&D money on, yet that's where it is. Well, I, I don't think we want anyone to spend their R&D money on that, <laughs> telco or other, but certainly not someone who it has a direct connection to our home, let's put it that way. Um, let me switch to the second question, which is, what are the, inha the inherent dangers, if any, of big tech being requested to pay for the network of telcos? So I don't have any, um, any love for the big tech companies, uh, but I would say that this mischaracterizes the problem. The problem here is not big tech paying for telcos. It's anyone who doesn't want to be a customer of the telco being forced to pay for the telco. Mm -hmm. And the way this is being constructed, sure, it catches big tech companies in its net, but there are only a few of them. What mostly the economy is populated with is startups and medium-sized companies. And they're also being asked to pay for the profit margins of the telcos. Um, the, the, desired greater profit margins of the telcos. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't particularly worry about the inequity of, um, you know, Apple, for instance, being asked to pay 
greater or pay pay money to Deutsche Telekom's shareholders, right? I mean, sure, there's no rationale for that. There's no logical reason for Apple to be paying Deutsche Telekom shareholders. But more of a problem is that Apple may have ways of fighting this, but a German startup does not. A German startup is caught in that same net that Apple is, yet has no defenses and is simply not going to survive this. Um, We already have a huge problem that the European startup sector uh, fails to to thrive, right? It gets to a certain point and either uh, collapses or gets taken over by a US company that can provide sort of a legal shield against these kinds of depredations. So the, the, it doesn't make sense for anyone other than a telco's customers to pay for the service that the telco is providing to the customer. But characterizing this as um, you know, a penalty levied against big tech is simply trying to use the animosity that big tech has quite clearly created for itself as a rationale for these artificial payments. Well, the actual artificial payments themselves would largely be coming from the parties who don't have the legal resources and defenses of the US government protecting them. And that is the European startup sector. Yeah, I think um, it, it obviously is more interesting for the press or anyone reporting on this to make it a big conflict between, you know, uh, big tech, big telcos on the one side, uh, and to completely forget, as you pointed out, the the, the thriving SME uh, network that we have in, in Europe more than in any other geography, actually. Uh, but also, I think, users. Uh, as you say, the relationship at the end of the day should one be should be the one between telcos and their users, and there shouldn't be third parties suddenly involved in that equation. Um, so you've talked about um, uh, investments and scale up issues of of, of uh, startups in Europe and the fact that you know they they hit a ceiling to a certain extent at some point. Um, but there's also been a lot of talk about investment in, in, in this discussion. So third question is, do you think it is appropriate to compare the contribution of big tech and telcos and in infrastructure as suggested by some? There, there are sort of two ways of looking at this. One is to say, well, some of these are telco carriers, and some of these are content distribution networks, and that's an apples to oranges comparison and makes no sense on the face of it. And that's true. Um, But more fundamentally to the point is the fact that the economic architecture of the internet is one in which bandwidth is produced in internet exchange points and is carried to the point of consumption by networks. And so the value of bandwidth increases as it uh, approaches the point of consumption, um, the, or rather the cost of it increases as it approaches the point of consumption. Um, the the uh, inputs, the investment inputs into transporting it increase as it approaches the point of consumption. Um, there are ways in which the actual value decreases is kind of a, a uh, the the latency and the loss and the, the quality characteristics uh, go go down as as it moves further and further from the point of production, the internet exchange point. Mm-hmm. But the fundamental point here is that money doesn't move through the internet exchange point. The internet exchange point is the source of the bandwidth going in both directions. Right? Mm-hmm. There's no user at the internet exchange point. The parties that want to talk to each other, let's say a website. The, say the the BBC and a user who wants to, you know, read an article off the BBC website, the internet service provider of the user and the internet service provider of the BBC meet 
at an internet exchange point in order to exchange that traffic. And they may in fact meet at two different internet exchange points for the two different directions. The two directions are completely independent of each other economically. So the role of the user's internet service provider is to accept traffic on the user's behalf at an internet exchange point, mm -hmm. carry it to the user, and then carry the reply back from the user to another internet exchange point, or maybe the same one. Um, and the same role was mirrored on the other side. There's no increased value uh, you know, to one side or the other, right? Mm -hmm. Each of these is completely an independent transaction between the internet service provider and their customer. Mm -hmm. um, so how well or poorly this happens is a matter of the efficiency of that network service provider. So if you hear someone complain, well, we've put a lot of money into this and our profits are too low, what that's saying is that they're operating inefficiently. And if their profits are too low, they need to charge their customer more money or they need to spend less money on their operations. They need to you know, operate more efficiently through laying in higher bandwidth circuits, for instance, which would carry more bandwidth for the same you know, underlying cost, um, which requires upgrading more frequently and so forth. It's, it's work, uh, but that's the work that in theory, the customer is paying the provider to do, to keep modernizing their networks so that there will always be enough bandwidth and so that the user can buy more bandwidth when they want to. At the same time, exactly the same transaction is happening on the other side of, of the exchange point between the content provider and their internet service provider, which is moving the content to an exchange point where it can be handed off. Now, a difference between content and users are that users pick their own location, whereas content can be replicated to many places. That's an efficiency on the content side. That's great. Um, but it has nothing to do with the user. These are two separate transactions that are independent of each other. So if you look at this and you say, well, <clears throat> the content carrying networks are more efficient and therefore they're more profitable. And so, you know, the markets reward them with a higher market cap and uh, people give them more respect or whatever. And the telcos operate, uh, many of them less efficiently, especially the large ones. Um, and so their market caps are lower and maybe their profit margins are lower, although somehow they seem to not <clears throat> quite be hit with that problem. Um, it's more a theoretical one than an actual one. Um, all this is really saying is that these are, yes, apples and oranges, two different kinds of customer, but not that anybody owes anybody any money, right? There, there is no market mechanism by which two competitors, two internet service providers would exchange money. One would pay the other when neither is providing a service to the other and neither wants to be a customer of the other, right? So by analogy, if you want to kind of understand this in physical world terms, as opposed to internet terms, imagine we lived in a world where farms were cooperatively owned and operated by trucking companies. And the cost of, of a vegetable at a farm was zero. So the trucking company, any trucking company that was a member of that farm could go to that farm and fill up their truck with as many vegetables as it could hold. And then it's their business to take those vegetables to where users want to consume them and charge the users for them at that point. This would be like saying, well, one trucking company is more profitable because they're operating their business more efficiently. Therefore, they should be penalized and should have to pay the less effective trucking company a settlement in order to make the less effective trucking company more profitable and reward their shareholders for being less efficient. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense from a business perspective. Doesn't make sense in terms of economic incentives certainly doesn't make sense in terms of, uh, terms of an overall economy. Yeah, I'm, fe I'm feeling sorry for the farmer that's seeing all his crops going away at no <laughs> at, for no money. <laughs> but, but the way internet exchange points are operated, they, they really are a communal effort of 
the internet service providers that participate there. So in that sense, there is no independent farmer, right? The farmer is yeah. a collective of Facebook and Deutsche Telekom and France Telekom and Hurricane Electric and NTT, and they're all collaborating to make that happen in that location and 700 other locations around the world. This is a very well-established model, right? Mm -hmm. We're 30 years into this model. It works really well, um, but undermining it by saying, well, you know, less effective people should be allowed to penalize more effective people is you know, that, um, that breaks a model that is working really well and has for 30 years and has given us the growth in terms of both total amount of bandwidth available and in terms of bandwidth per euro mm -hmm. to the end user. I, I think you're you're reaching your soapbox moment. Uh, <laughs> we already had a little glimpse, I think, uh, at the end uh, now. So let me switch and put on screen uh, Roberta and Ursula, the uh, respective uh, presidents of the European Parliament and the European Commission. Um, I, I theoretically say you have one minute. It can be two if you're feeling inspired. But basically, what... What message do you want to deliver to the powers that be in the EU in terms of, um, you know, how they look at the Internet moving forward? I think the single most important thing that we have to remember if we're going to regulate the Internet is that startups don't have a voice in government. Startups are not. Uh, represented by lobbyists in Brussels or in the national capitals. Startups are, you know, one person hiring two of her friends to, you know, start a new business. And that's where the economic growth comes from. 100% of the economic growth comes from startups and sort of small and medium-sized companies. Big companies, you know, do mergers and acquisitions. They do layoffs. They discontinue products. They uh, merge things together. All of that is, is effectively negative growth. Um, so we've got to protect startups. And anything that lobbyists for incumbent monopolies are there advocating for is likely to be antagonistic to the interests of the startups that are the ones that are producing the things that people want and producing the innovation and producing the jobs and producing the economic growth. So as a regulator, when you see a lobbyist coming in and the lobbyist is advocating for the interests of you know, the incumbent telco, probably you want to be doing the opposite. Yet, that's the voice you're hearing. So that's the problem, is if we're going to regulate the internet, we need to avoid regulatory capture. And most internet regulators are either captured at this point or are struggling to avoid it. And we've got to bolster their defenses against that. We have to pay more attention to how we keep internet regulation from being captured by incumbents. Thank you, Bill. Um, I um, think that that is uh, often an issue, is very few voices get represented in the debates in, in Brussels. And it's difficult because, as you say, startups' priority is not lobbying. It's creating innovative products and, and selling them and, and growing, uh, which is good for them. <laughs> um, Hopefully, um, through this podcast, we can try to amplify more voices and get more than the usual suspects to um, explain how the internet functions and how it should continue to function in Brussels. Um, we will see what comes out of the connectivity uh, act that is expected uh, before the end of this year. And um, two options will be available, either... Um, it looks like an act that uh, tries to protect the general interests and consumers and startups. And then we will not need to do a follow-up podcast or we get something where there is uh, regulatory capture and we will probably then continue this discussion. <laughs> <laughs>